To diagnose Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, it's important to do a number of things. And these are all specified very nicely in the NCCN criteria. But you do need to do a bone marrow biopsy. This will allow one to be able to look at the morphology of the bone marrow to determine if a lymphoplasmacytic cell infiltrate is present. And in addition, uh, it also allows for the opportunity to do molecular diagnostic testing uh, for both the MYD88 mutation as well as CXCR4. And we know that both of these mutations are very important determinants of um, disease presentation and can help us also predict which therapeutics uh, should be considered in the treatment of Waldenstrom's. Uh, in addition to that, we would want blood testing to be done. You'd want to be able to determine that there's a monoclonal IgM protein. You'd want to be able to look at the serum IgM level, because this also could be very important in managing the patient, given the concerns around hyperviscosity. You'd want to know what the CBC looks like. You'd want to be able to get a prognostic marker like a beta-2 microglobulin uh, level. And we would also, as part of the workup, also consider doing uh, CT scans of the abdomen, chest, and pelvis to determine uh, whether extramedullary disease is present. And we see that in about 20% of cases, even at time of diagnosis. Well, it's very important when you look at the bone marrow biopsy of a patient uh, to do molecular diagnostic testing. And MYD88 testing is essential. It helps us in being able to make the diagnosis of Waldenstrom's. And it's important for the clinicians to keep in mind, there are other things that can overlap and look very similar to Waldenstrom's. Take, for instance, IgM myeloma. We recently had a very nice publication alluding to the fact that in MYD88 uh, wild-type patients, those that don't have the MYD88 mutation, uh, many times IgM myeloma cases were lumped in. They can have very similar disease features. And it's really important to be able to separate those patients out because, of course, they're managed very, very differently. So MYD88 testing, very important. Also, CXCR4 testing. Uh, it's a very important marker in terms of understanding disease presentation. Those patients that have the mutation, particularly those that have the nonsense variant, that's where you know, part of the protein becomes truncated, usually present with high IgM levels and even symptomatic hyperviscosity. But also CXCR4 is giving us a window into the therapeutics that we ought to be considering for these patients, including the, the use of BTK inhibitors. Imaging tests um, can be considered for Waldenstrom's patients. Um, one should consider it a time of diagnosis to be able to understand if extramedullary disease is present, uh, but also a time of relapse where it's much more common to have extramedullary disease. Um, we also have numerous cases of uh, disease um, in, um, you know, outside of lymph nodes, um, including uh, the pleural space. Uh, so, you know, that would be on a, uh, you know, need, need to understand basis when you have patient presenting with a particular symptomatology. We also consider PET scans in the management of Waldenstrom patients when we start suspecting transformation. So if you have a particular area that, you know, shows exaggerated uh, tumor cell growth, you know, lymph nodes that are out of bounds in a particular regional area, it's important to consider a PET scan to be able to rule out transformation because those patients invariably will be treated very differently. So when you look at the diagnostic uh, uh, criteria for Waldenstrom's, we take into account the MYD88 status, particularly uh, when we start considering prognosis. Those patients that have the MYD88 mutation appear to do better. They have longer survival, and in fact, the survival has changed tremendously uh, given many new therapeutics, including BTK inhibitors that have been introduced. So over 18 years is now the median overall survival when one looks at the median eight mutated population. And that's about 95 to 97% of all patients. Uh, this was a mutation that we discovered in our laboratory uh, thanks to whole genome sequencing. And about 95% of all the patients will have the L265P variant. This is where a leucine uh, is actually substituted by a proline. And whenever you see that, you gotta suspect that there's gonna be important structural changes uh, to the molecule itself. So you can pick this up by using uh, allele-specific PCR. This is usually what's done in most molecular uh, laboratories. But a small percentage of patients will also have non-L265P mid-88 variants. Um, if you are working this patient up and you find that the patient is wild type, meaning that you don't see the mid-88 mutation, but you have a strong suspicion for Waldenstrom, you gotta consider also these other uh, variants may be present because if you have a mid-88 mutation, 
not only does it have an important prognostic you know, connotation, but it also helps you with therapeutics. BTK inhibitors in particular are good for those patients that have a MIDI-D8 mutation. Well, we test for CXCR4 because it's very important uh, to um, be able to work this into the use of therapeutics. And also, you know, to give you at least some idea of how those therapeutics ought to be used. For instance, with CXCR4 mutations, we know that time to response with BTK inhibitors is going to be lagging. Um, so if you need somebody who needs an immediate response, somebody with, let's say, symptomatic hyperviscosity who you need to get their IgM done, you may consider uh, an alternative therapeutic if somebody has a CXCR4 mutation and you're looking to have a fast response. We also know from the Innovate data that was just updated at ASH that the addition of rituximab may be particularly beneficial to that population of patients that are CXCR4 mutated. In fact, we see a much quicker time to major response. So understanding what the underlying CXCR4 mutation status is very important. We also now are recognizing more and more that TP53 mutations may also uh, be important. Uh, this is a, you know, a small population of all Waldenstrom's patients, maybe about 2 to 5% of all patients based on what we know so far. But these are usually um, you know, patients that have um, you know, more aggressive disease, uh, and they seem to benefit with BTK inhibitors. So it's important for one to be able to also consider TP53 testing when it's available.